had another momentous week. Interim President Juan Guaido's return to Venezuela uh, was an important milestone for his efforts to restore democracy to his country. The warm welcome he received from Venezuelans and the international community is a sign of the broad support he enjoys. Uh, you also know that uh, the regime uh, illegitimately declared or attempted to declare the uh, German ambassador to Venezuela, uh, Daniel Kriner, uh, persona non grata. Uh, the United States stands with Germany and the more than 50 other countries in the world recognizing uh, Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. Humanitarian aid, our uh, humanitarian aid flights continue. Uh, to Cucuta, to his flight this week, in support of the urgent humanitarian needs of the Venezuelan people. And as you know, since February 4th, we have prepositioned hundreds of metric tons of critical relief supplies in Colombia and Brazil, uh, procured internationally and also procured locally uh, there to help uh, tens of thousands of Venezuelans. Yesterday's flight included uh, life-saving medical supplies for hospitals and clinics. And we are continuing to try to find ways to support the people of Venezuela during this humanitarian crisis and ways to get that aid in. On visas, uh, earlier this week, Vice President Pence announced another 77 visa revocations of regime officials and their families. You remember that Last time I was here, it, I announced uh, 49. That's going to continue. We are going to continue to use this tool to show these officials and their families they are not welcome in the United States and to show that fact to all Venezuelans. We are using sanctions and diplomatic actions to pressure the Maduro regime, a regime that continues to undermine democratic institutions carry out human rights abuses, and engage in rampant corruption. Uh, we are hopeful that other countries will use these and other tools at their disposal to increase the pressure on Maduro's inner circle and family members. Uh, Treasury is continuing its sanctions of financial institutions. Uh, and as I said yesterday uh, on the Hill, there will be more. The nationwide power outage throughout Venezuela is a reminder that the country's uh, once quite sophisticated infrastructure has been plundered and allowed to decay under Maduro's miss rule. For Venezuelans, this is much more than an inconvenience. Uh, it affects safety and security in an already dangerous country. For those in hospitals, this can affect life-saving care. For those who have used very scarce personal resources to buy perishable foods that are already hard to come by, this can mean foregoing yet another meal or risking illness. As Secretary Pompeo tweeted last night, Maduro's policies bring nothing but darkness. Uh, just a word about the hearing yesterday. Uh, it was interesting that it was a subcommittee hearing, the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, but the chairman of the full committee, uh, Chairman Rich, and the ranking member of the full committee, Senator Menendez, uh, were both present in addition to the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee. That's reasonably rare, and it shows the level of interest. And I think we also saw yesterday the uh, bipartisan support for the policy of um, the administration in supporting Juan Guaido as interim president and uh, helping the Venezuelan people uh, achieve a return to democracy in Venezuela. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. So uh, two things briefly. One, uh, did, did, did the U.S. have anything to do with the power outage, as some people have suggested uh, in a conspiratorial way? Perhaps? No, that's an easy one. Okay. So what, well, what, what's the cause of it as far as you know? I don't know the exact cause. I don't know what, you know, what line um, 
was overburdened or what transformer blew up or, or um, what caused it. I imagine that in the coming days we'll be able to find out. But um, uh, somebody sent me an email this morning saying that um, this has been predicted that the maintenance has not been taking place and that a number of experts having looked at this over the course of the last year said there are going to be more and more blackouts. Now, of course, there are, there have been a series of temporary blackouts. There's never been a basically nationwide blackout of what is now roughly 20 hours. That's new. Okay, and then secondly, you keep referring to the, you know, the support that uh, interim President Guaido has from the international community, you mentioned Germany specifically, but the number of countries that recognize him as, and not Maduro, as the legitimate leader is static. It's not, it's 54, right? And it hasn't moved since you were last here a week ago, right? So in your mind, what the international community is, is 54 countries. I mean, that's fewer than are in the coalition against ISIS. It's fewer than they were in the coalition of the willing and I mean, far fewer. Um, and again, it's only it's less than a third of UN member states. So what's the justification for saying that this support is increasing or even that the international community, quote unquote, unless you have an odd definition of international community being a small number, what, what, what backs up the claim that he has increasing well, support? I would say first, I think if you identify the countries, you have most of the world's leading democracies in the Western Hemisphere and in Europe. Um, and you have uh, many that are economically significant. Um, secondly, uh, in our conversations with other countries that have not recognized President Guaido, we do not hear very often, you have the wrong policy. What we hear is we're not there quite yet, or this is a domestic political issue, we're trying to solve it. Or frankly, in the case of the Caribbean, we hear great concern about debts and what the regime might do. Um, in some cases where countries have lots of citizens of their own in Venezuela, they say that they are concerned that uh, their embassy might be closed. Um, or there might be uh, actions taken against their citizens. We do not hear that is, uh, oh, this is all wrong, and we don't agree with your support of interim President Guaido. I, I so you said that you had spoken to the Russians. Don't they say that? Don't the Chinese say that? But the Russians and the Chinese do say that. I right. wasn't talking about the Russians and oh, Chinese. Okay. I was basically talking about democracies that are not yet recognized uh, Mr. Guaido as president. Um, I'm really happy with the list of countries we have. It will be nice to add to it. I don't know that it will make a huge difference to the internal situation in Venezuela, frankly. Uh, uh, so we're, um, we're trying to expand the list, but I think the extraordinary thing here is, again, we have, if my, I think I have the number right, 24 of 28 EU countries. We have most of the major uh, Western Hemispheric countries in Latin America, Canada, the United States, and that's very rare in a situation like this. So we're, we're very happy with where we are in terms of international support. Let's go Washington Post, Carol. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abrams. Uh, you say that the United States had nothing to do with the immediate cause of this electricity going down, down but is it possible that sanctions uh, may have exacerbated the situation and indirectly caused it? And, and do you really have any other arrows in your quiver besides sanctions? Uh, and if they don't work, why is Maduro still clinging to power? Um, I don't accept the argument which I have heard um, made that one of the key causes to problems inside Venezuela, economic problems, uh, is our sanctions. And I would urge you to take a look at comments made yesterday uh, actually, in the, at the end of, the, of uh, my own uh, appearance, uh, in the beginning of the second panel, by Senator Menendez, who addressed this issue squarely and reminded uh, the committee uh, that the sanctions are uh, much newer than the problems. This is a 
multi-year decline in Venezuela. The, the, um, the situation there due to the mismanagement, the economic policies, and the sheer corruption of this regime are the cause of those problems. So uh, the United States did not cause those problems. The international community did not. The regime caused those problems. The United States had nothing to do with the regime's failure over a 10-year period to attend to the electric infrastructure of the country, for example. So I just, um, I don't accept that view. Um, as to the second part of the question, uh, you know, we are working with uh, the National Assembly, uh, Interim President Guaido, lots of other countries, um, to put uh, diplomatic pressure on the regime to help the National Assembly, which is actually acting as an assembly. I mean, they meet, they pass laws uh, to prepare for the transition. Um, I do think that the sanctions are very useful in bringing home uh, to people in the regime, as well as other Venezuelans, that they're in a situation that cannot possibly end well for them. So uh, we make no apologies uh, for the sanctions. I do think that there were a lot of people who had the view that, oh, the United States is going to do pay-to-basis sanctions, for example. Um, and then Maduro will leave, and then it will be February. Uh, we did not have that view. And as I think I may have said here, but I frankly don't remember, uh, Secretary Pompeo did not, when he asked me to do this, say, come on over to the State Department for three or four weeks, and we'll resolve all this, and then you go back to the Council on Foreign Relations. We have understood that this is a struggle in Venezuela, uh, whose length we can't predict. No one can predict it. Regimes always look, uh, or often look, quite solid and quite strong the day before they collapse. So none of us know uh, how to predict the timing. Uh, but I think the direction is very, very clear, and the outcome is clear. Um, Mr. Evans, um, I wanted to ask you two things. Number one, the Ligma Group proposed the use of force, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of support for a military intervention in the U.S. Congress. Uh, what would it take for the U.S. government to take a more decisive uh, position uh, towards a military intervention? What would have to happen? And number two, uh, Human Rights Watch and some of uh, Mr. White House public officials here in Washington ask for the U.S. government to include Venezuelans within the TPS program. You said in Congress that it was under review. Um, what would it take for uh, the White House to clear Venezuelans for a TPS program? Thank you. Um, on the second point, I really don't have anything to add to what I said at the hearing yesterday. We're aware of the situation of Venezuelans in the United States. We're aware of uh, views of many in Congress, particularly uh, senators and congressmen and women who represent Florida. Uh, we're aware of the legislation that Senator Rubio and I think Senator Menendez have introduced, and we are working on this issue. We are thinking about how to address this issue. I would uh, point out that uh, there are 74,000 current applications for asylum uh, by Venezuelans in the United States, and those applications represent sometimes individuals, but they may also represent families. So we're not exactly sure of the number of people who are included in asylum applications. So Venezuelans who are here are aware of how they can try to uh, regularize their status and stay in the United States longer. But anyway, we are, uh, that's a subject of concern that we are uh, thinking about. What would have to happen uh, to use the military? You know, uh, I can't speculate about that. There, this is um, uh, a dangerous world. Uh, one cannot predict the way things turn. I wouldn't try to do so. I wouldn't want to give you hypotheticals. Um, but I would just say uh, the President has said all options are on the table. They always are on the table. Um, but that is not the path we are choosing to follow. The path we're choosing to follow uh, now is, is the one that has been uh, often described, which is diplomatic, uh, economic and financial pressure uh, in an effort to support the 
people of Venezuela. That's the path we're taking now. In the weeks since uh, Juan Guaido was recognized the interim president, the Secretary of State and you have sort of intimated that there would be that the military would flip in imminently that something might happen next week or the next week. Have you been disappointed? I mean, you remarked a little bit about the timeline, but have you been disappointed that the military continues to seemingly side with what we're doing? I wouldn't say that I'm, I wouldn't use the word disappointed. I would say we um, continue to call on the Venezuelan military to follow their own constitution. We call on them to restore, um, it's better in Spanish, you know, institucionalidad. Uh, we don't really have a word in English, institutionality, but um, to restore their own proper role uh, in any country. One of the definitions of having a state is having monopoly on uh, force and violence for the security forces of the state. Uh, that's not happening in Venezuela where the government is using, the regime is using um, armed gangs, colectivos. Uh, one would think that the police and military in any country would find that unacceptable. Um, so we uh, continue to hope that people in the Venezuelan uh, security forces uh, understand that the future of their country is going to be in much better hands if the Maduro regime comes to an end and the transition to democracy begins. And again, I would say um, it doesn't look like that is happening until the day that it begins to happen. So you have no indication right now that that's imminent? Uh, uh, well, we have, you know, um, we have lots of information suggesting that just as most Venezuelans are clearly unhappy with this regime and want it to come to an end, most members of the Venezuelan military feel the same way. Uh, that's not surprising. If you're a member of the Venezuelan military, you may get, you may get a small and inadequate lunch at the barracks, but that doesn't help your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and your brothers and your sisters. Members of the Venezuelan military know what's going on in the country. Uh, so we will continue to call upon them to act upon that knowledge. PBS. Thanks, Mr. Anderson. Two, two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one, the National Security Advisor talked about secondary sanctions on Twitter, uh, kind of an invitation for you to put some meat on the bone. Is that about Russia and Cuba? Is that about India, who's been buying uh, petrol from Venezuela? Is that about ships going between Venezuela and Cuba? Uh, and the second one, there were 200 uh, soldiers or exiled soldiers near the bridge in Cucuta the day that the humanitarian uh, assistance was supposed to cross, led by General Alcala. Uh, Colombian government stepped in and stopped that plan. Was the U.S. involved with that at all? Regardless of that, is it helpful to have that happen? Thanks. The United States government has said that we will not use force uh, to deliver that aid. Uh, and the Colombian government has said the same thing. So obviously we agree with that view and would not be involved in any um, actions that would be contrary to that view. Uh, on secondary sanctions, you know, it's always, it's out there. It's always a possibility. Uh, we have not done it yet, um, and I wouldn't want to speculate as to whether we will or what would lead us to make that additional decision. Fox. Mr. Abrams. Um, is, uh, following up on, on Nick's question, is, is there a way beyond sanctions perhaps that the United States can get to or attempt to turn uh, the military and political leadership in that country? And um, just a second question, uh, 16 Democratic lawmakers reportedly sent the State Department a letter saying that the U.S. stands alone in imposing sanctions against Venezuela, that it hurts the civilian population there, uh, and that it also plays into the narrative that Juan Guaido is a puppet of Washington, if you wouldn't mind responding to that as well. We've been saying from the, from the very beginning of the sanctions that the sanctions are meant to be temporary. Uh, every single notice from Treasury, and you can see this in the, ne the next notice, says sanctions can be removed. 
the purpose is to motivate people to change their behavior. So uh, while we impose sanctions of visa revocations, we make it very clear this is reversible if people's pattern of conduct changes. So it's not just a punishment. We hope it is also an inducement uh, to a changed pattern of behavior. Um, the, the allegation that Juan Guaido is some kind of puppet of the United States, I think, is first ridiculous, and second, has been disproved in a number of ways. One of them is the number of countries that support him, countries which uh, were called puppets of the United States in the UN Security Council in a manner, I must say, that did not help the cause of Nicolas Maduro and his regime. Um, but you saw the way in which Guaido was received as he stopped in a bunch of Latin American capitals received by the presidents of those countries. Um, so I, I just think um, if you look at the Lima Group, if you look at the EU countries, the leadership we've seen in Canada, where, which hosted a Lima Group meeting, it's a ridiculous, um, it's a ridiculous charge. Um, as to the, again, as to the sanctions hurting people in Venezuela, um, the United States has now spent weeks trying to get additional aid into Venezuela. We have actually used DOD assets to move the aid as close to the border of Venezuela as we possibly could. The reason that aid has not gotten in, and much more aid that could get in, uh, could get in from uh, Curacao by boat that could get in across the Brazilian border is very simple to describe. It's the Maduro regime. Uh, but again, I would add, um, as I did, uh, I guess, to Carol, that this economic decline is not new. The situation in Venezuela now is the product of years of corruption and incompetence and venality on the part of this regime. Uh, that's the problem, and the solution is to replace it with a democratic government that actually is responsive to the needs of the people. Senator Rubio made the comment yesterday that uh, <coughs> there is, um, this was after um, Administrator Green's testimony, there is malnourishment uh, and there is real hunger in Venezuela, but when you look at Maduro and his closest aides, you don't see any malnourishment. They're not sharing in the suffering of the, of the people, which is, um, which is considerable. Uh, so we're trying to help, and the regime has, has not permitted it. Other countries, Latin American countries, European countries, <coughs> have sent food. Several Latin American countries sent uh, food to Cucuta. Uh, and it's clear that more would be available if the regime would let it in. Mm -hmm. Last question, BBC. Um, the UN is again uh, warning about the growing refugee crisis. So I just wondered, is the, the administration um, at all open to taking in uh, some Venezuelan refugees as part of its policy, or is that absolutely not a consideration? And secondly, I just wonder about your take on how Guaido was uh, allowed back into the country without um, uh, there was, you know, warnings that he might be arrested and, and that sort of thing. But <coughs> so, what's your take on on how he was able to come back? There were some statements by people in the regime that he would be arrested. There were lots of voices out there. Some said he will be arrested. Some said uh, justice will be done, or other words like that that suggested he would be. And of course, we feared uh, not only for his arrest, but worse. Uh, it didn't happen. And he made the comment that when he, as he passed through Customs and Immigration, one of the agents said, um, welcome, bienvenido presidente, welcome president, it's extraordinary. He then rode into town and he rode past a neighborhood that is generally viewed of uh, uh, apartment houses um, built in the Chavez period that is generally viewed as an area not only that is pro-Chavez, but where a lot of colectivos are. And people were cheering. So I think his, um, his uh, reception was extraordinary. 
Why did the regime decide to do it? You know, one can only speculate. And our speculation is that they thought the public reaction, the popular reaction, would be dangerous to the regime if they acted against him. Uh, on the refugee situation, uh, well, I've said before that we are, you know, we're thinking about the question of uh, Venezuelans who are in the United States, and a very significant proportion of the Venezuelans in the United States are already availing themselves, in a sense, of American uh, refugee and asylum policy by uh, seeking asylum status. Um, in general, I guess I, I should say that that um, most Venezuelans don't have that opportunity and have taken the opportunity instead uh, to walk or go uh, by bus, in many cases, um, across the borders, particularly uh, to Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and uh, those countries have proved very hospitable to them. I guess I'll leave it there. But the only Thank discussion you. about refugees is about TPS. It's not about refugees. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.